I want to take the ideas that we just kind of went through and apply them to the domain of savings. And I want to think about why people might procrastinate when it comes to joining a savings plan or raising a savings rate or doing, doing anything that they have to do in the American workplace to save. So one problem is that joining a 401k plan is a kind of effortful task. You've got to read the paperwork. You've got to call the human resources department. You've got to figure out how the whole thing works. What are the rules? How do I do it? How do I sign up? Filling out various forms it takes about an hour. And for a lot of American households, that's a really miserable experience. They got to confront all these things they haven't done for a long time and admit that we're not saving enough. I'm making a mess of my financial life. And now I'm going to sit down and think about it. Well. In the setting that we've been describing, wouldn't it be nice psychologically to not confront that miserable hour tonight and simply do the hard work of signing up next week? If I psychologically discount the future, then I psychologically perceive the cost of enrolling in a savings plan to be half as great if I can move it from right now to next month. So that's the first mechanism, the first explanation for why American households are postponing this important behavior. The second explanation equally important is a lot of American households, probably 60% of American households, are really living hand to mouth. They've got no spare cash. There's no flexibility. They're spending every paycheck down. Their bank account is basically just breaking even at the end of the month when they make their mortgage payment. And they believe often that their financial lives are going to get better in the future. So they think, next month I'll save. Next month I'll clean up, my me clean up my messy financial details. Next month I'll start cutting back. Next month I'll recover from all of these financial calamities. So I'm not going to save right now. And of course, every month, once again, they face the same kinds of problems, the same kinds of pressures. And the decision to save gets pushed yet another month into the future. So we end up with this cycle of procrastination where we've got good intentions. We plan to join the savings plan. We plan to raise our savings rate. But it's always better to do it later rather than right now. Now, the good news is that we've got lots of new techniques for nudging American households to save more. And I want to quickly kind of review how those work. And they all feed off the kinds of procrastination cycles that I've been talking about. Now, the way the system works, as you probably know, is that an American worker tells their firm that they want to save. So typically what happens is they start as a non-enrollee in the savings plan. The firm gives them the opportunity to enroll in the savings plan. Here it would be a 401k plan. But there's some barrier, which we talked about a minute ago, which is the barrier that comes from the sign-up cost. I've got to spend an hour or two figuring things out, reading the paperwork. That's effortful. That's distracting. Uh, that's not fun. Better to do it in the future. Now the obvious solution, which has taken the US by storm, is to change the balance so that rather than advantaging the status quo of non-enrollment, we instead advantage the status quo of enrollment. So how do you do that? Very simply, we simply switch the system so that rather than starting American workers as non-enrollees, we start American workers as enrollees. And now procrastination actually works to hold them in the plan as savers. Now they've got to exert some effort to get out of the situation of being an active participant. So that's one system. And increasingly, large American employers are adopting automatic enrollment. But a lot of people don't like automatic enrollment. They say, look, why should I advantage savings? That sounds like a very paternalistic policy. Why should I nudge people in this way? Uh, I don't like the idea of playing paternalist. So now let me challenge you and ask, what would you do as an alternative to playing paternalist? What else could you do if you didn't want to advantage savings, if you wanted to put non-participation and participation on the same level playing field so that neither kind of had the advantage of being the starting point. What could you do? Yeah. Exactly. So we call that active choice. And the idea there is to basically put both options, this is the libertarian approach, to put both options on the left-hand side of the hurdle. Tell newly hire work, hired workers, you've got to choose. You've got to make a decision. This is too important to leave it to procrastination or some passive outcome. You've got to actively choose. And there are lots of things in, in life where we think that the stakes are so high that we ask people to actively make a choice, like your health care decision when you join a new firm. Why shouldn't your 401k decision have the same form? You must choose. 
So when you do that, we're not advantaging either outcome, and we'll see in a second how that works. Now, there's a third system for getting people over the hump of action to get them out of this kind of passive state of sticking as a non-enrollee. I mentioned a moment ago that procrastination plays a big role because there's this barrier to action in the form of an hour of paperwork. Now, for goodness sake, it shouldn't matter, right? An hour of paperwork should not get in the way of doing one of the most important things you'll do in your entire life, which is start saving for retirement. There are enormous stakes. You've got 30 years as a retiree. An hour of paperwork shouldn't matter. And yet it does matter, as you'll see in a second. So what we thought to do here is to simply take that hour of paperwork and shrink it down. We thought to take the hard logistics and turn it into a check-a-box enrollment system. So now you just check a box and you're enrolled. It took you 30 seconds rather than an hour of reading documents that confused you. So let's see how these different systems work to nudge people from a state of non-saving to saving. So when you tell American workers that they're initiating life in the firm as a non-enrollee, and if they want to, they can opt out, but if they do nothing, they stay as a non-enrollee in the savings plan. After a year of tenure, you find that about 40% of the workforce is savings, is in the plan, in the 401k plan. When you introduce quick enrollment, which is the check-a-box enrollment system, you knock the participation rate up from 40% to 50%. When you force American workers to experience the libertarian fantasy of active choice, you must choose. Being passive is not an option. We require you to be an active participant in your own destiny. There is no default. We get 70% enrollment. And when we automatically enroll them and give them the option to opt out, now we get 90% enrollment. Now, to a classical economist, these four systems should not generate very different outcomes. In every case, the worker has the exact same set of options. But it turns out the psychology is very powerful here. And how you design the choice architecture makes all the difference in the outcomes that we get in the American saving system. And increasingly, other countries are getting this message and adopting the nudges towards saving, taking the view that just giving people the opportunity to save is not enough. We need to actually nudge them to saving through some kind of automatic enrollment or other system that makes saving easy. Now, having said all this, I've left a theme on the table that maybe was obvious to you 15 minutes ago. And that's the theme that if people have self-control problems, they might be willing to actually tie their own hands to reduce the temptation that they experience. So let's think about the preferences that we talked about earlier, preferences where people say, tomorrow I'm going to exercise, and then in fact, when tomorrow arrives, they don't follow through. Or tomorrow I'm going to go visit my physician, make the appointment with my primary care physician, or eat better, or whatever, do that problem set, and then I don't follow through. If people recognize that they have these self-control problems, they may be willing to tie their hands so they in fact do follow through when the moment of action arises in the future. So let me ask you again, how do you tie your hands, or if you succeed in exercising, which I rarely do, how do you tie your hands to get yourself to exercise? What are the techniques that people use to force their future selves to do what their current self wants? Well, there are three techniques that come to mind for me. A lot of people have personal trainers. If you're rich enough, that's one way to go. Uh, a lot of people use exercise classes that kind of locks you down on a particular date on the calendar each week, and you're kind of committed to show up. They expect you, and you've paid for it. And then for me, the best option is the third option, the exercise partner. I, I intentionally arrange to exercise with a friend because I know that if I don't set it up ahead of time that way, I'll never show up. If, I ex if I'm asked to jog on my own, impossible. But if I jog with a friend, well, they're out there at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, so I'll show up as well. Well, is the same kind of commitment, the strategy of tying your own hands so you do this good behavior, plausible in the realm of savings? Are people willing in the realm of savings to tie their hands to force themselves to save? Well, to begin to explore that question, I ran an experiment with John Beshares and James Choi and, it, and Bridget Madrian and Jung Sukung. 
And we gave our subjects $100, so this is real money that we gave them, experimental money, but it's real money. And we asked them to allocate that money across two accounts. One account we called the Freedom Account. We actually used that nomenclature with the subjects. And the other account we called the Goal Account. They had identical interest rates. They both offered a 22% interest rate. We set it high because we wanted them to not cash out right away and pay off their credit card debt. Uh, we wanted them to think of this as a good opportunity. The Goal Account had the same interest rate, but it had an illiquidity feature. It tied their hands up to a goal date of their own setting. So the subjects picked a goal date. Each of them picked their own goal date. And up to the goal date, the goal account was at least partially illiquid. And after the goal date, the goal account was completely liquid. Now let me ask you, if I gave you $100, would you put money in the goal account? Would you set a goal date that was meaningfully in the future? Or would you just take it all in the freedom account and maximize your liberty and maximize your flexibility? Let me take a vote. Who would put at least some money into the goal account? So you look a lot like our subjects. About 80% of our subjects put at least some money into the goal account. When the goal account had a 10% penalty, 80% of the subjects put at least some money in, and that ended up being about 35% of the total dollars that we gave the subjects. So 35% of the money ended up in the goal account when the goal account had a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. Then we did another experiment with the same pool of subjects. We asked these subjects to allocate $100 between a goal account with a 20% penalty and a freedom account. Again, the same interest on both accounts. What do you think happened? Did the increase in the illiquidity, did the higher penalty drive people away from the goal account or drive them towards the goal account because it gave them a better technology for tying their own hands? What do you think? So who says away? Who says towards? Okay, so about an even split, which is why we run these experiments. Drove them towards. Now the fraction that, of money that ended up in the goal account rose to 43%. And then we took a third group of subjects from the same pool of subjects, and we asked them to allocate money between a goal account that was completely illiquid and a freedom account. And again, the complete illiquidity is up to the goal date. So after the goal date, it becomes liquid. Now in this case, we told the subjects, we don't care. You can have an emergency, you can have a foreclosure, you can have a health crisis, your daughter can get married and you can't afford it. You cannot get access to your money up to the goal account, up to the goal date that you set. No liquidity whatsoever. Now you can kind of see where this is going. In fact, this generated the highest interest of all the cases. Now 56% of the money ended up in the goal account. So the more illiquid we made the account, the more our subject said, terrific, that's what I want. Now, as I show you these three cases, think for a second about what the modern American saving system looks like. Does it look like a lockbox account, the final row? No. The IRA, the 401k, have a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. So our system is the top line, not the bottom line. Now let's talk a bit about that system. There is $11 trillion in balances in the defined contribution saving system in the United States. Annual inflows into that system represent about $500 billion a year. That's a rough estimate, the $500 billion. The $11 trillion we really can nail down. But the problem in the American saving system is that there's a lot of leakage. A lot of the money that goes into these accounts goes out. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens because you're allowed to take a loan on these accounts, and if you don't repay the loan, then the money basically has left the account. So a loan does not count as leakage, but an unpaid loan from your 401k does count as leakage. You can also take unpenalized withdrawals from IRAs for certain purposes, to buy your first home, for educational expenses, for certain health expenses, and if you're 59 and a half, even if you're not retired, 59 and a half or older, even if you're not retired. And finally, there are penalized withdrawals at the 10% penalty rate. So for all these reasons, or for all, through all these channels, money is rapidly leaking out of the U.S. retirement savings system before people retire. 
We don't have a really tight estimate of exactly what this leakage represents, but it seems to represent about 2 to 4 percent of the balances in these accounts, depending upon who's doing the estimate. Now, what does that amount to? $250 billion a year, a year is leaking out of these accounts, maybe even more than that. Compare that to the $500 billion number at the top of the slide. So right now, for every $2 that goes into these accounts, a dollar is coming out in the form of pre-retirees spending the money before retirement. So we've got an enormous leakage problem in the U.S. retirement savings system. Now, partly that's reflected in our abysmal savings rate. I'm showing you here the net national savings rate, which combines all savings in the economy. And you can see here the pretty dire picture that tells us we're not getting ready for the demographic transition. We're facing an enormous transition as the baby boomers retire. You'd expect that to be accompanied by a rising savings rate. Instead, we've had a falling savings rate since the 1960s. These days, the savings rate, the net national savings rate, is bouncing around zero. Now, that's an aggregate. Um, I want you to think about an individual household. I think that's the most useful way to think about how we save and how we fail to save. I want to show you the way the U.S. retirement savings system was supposed to work. This is the idealized form. This is what we should have gotten. This is the way it was built. Imagine to simulate things, to keep things simple, a 6.5 percent guaranteed rate of return. In the real world, you don't get guaranteed rates of return, but that's useful to give you a single number that represents the outcome of this simulation. Imagine a 2 percent inflation rate. That's the norm these days. Imagine that workers are saving 6 percent of their salary in their 401k plan. Consider a 100 percent employer match. Dollar for dollar, they're getting matched up to 6 percent. Imagine no leakage from these accounts. Every dollar that goes in stays in until I retire. Imagine that I start working at age 22. My first salary is $35,000. I start saving at age 22. I have 1 percent real wage growth. I have a 50 percent Social Security replacement rate, which means that when I retire, Social Security replaces half of my final paycheck, which means I only need to replace the other half if I want to get 100 percent replacement. Finally, imagine that I have a 4 percent consumption rule in retirement. I spend 4 percent of my financial wealth in retirement each year. What does that imply for an American household who lives this not so crazy simulation? A 103 percent replacement ratio. Terrific. I retire and my consumption actually goes up. Fantastic. What a great retirement. This household retires under this scenario with about $719,000. That's inflation adjusted dollars, so real dollars. And they also in the simulation have their house paid off and they've got Social Security too. Put that all together, they've got this fantastic replacement ratio. So this is the micro story that we should have gotten. This is the experience that American households should have had. Let's make it more realistic. Let's talk about what American households actually have. What's happening to the typical American household? Well, let's begin with the scenario I told you, and let's make it more realistic step by step. Let's begin by introducing leakage. As I said before, there's a lot of leakage in these accounts. Let's assume leakage of 3.5 percent per year. That immediately drops the number down from 719 to 302. Let's add the fact that 40 percent of American households don't have an employer-sponsored retirement savings account. And there, this 40 percent is saving at a much lower rate. Without the employer nudging them to save, very few of them actually do save year to year. Let's introduce a 50 percent match rate, not a 100 percent match rate. I get matched 50 cents on each dollar. Let's introduce a net return, an, a risk-adjusted net return of 5.5 percent guaranteed, not 6.5 percent guaranteed. My previous number was too optimistic. Let's acknowledge that even people who do have access to a retirement savings plan often don't participate. About one in five workers at firms with a retirement savings plan do not participate in that plan. Let's acknowledge that a lot of households don't start saving at age 22. In fact, they start saving at age 30. And finally, let's accept that the Social Security Trust Fund is heading towards insolvency. When we clean that up, we're going to have lower benefits. Let's give people a, a five percentage point lower replacement rate from Social Security. All in now, once we make the simulation realistic, 
the typical American household retires with a 51% replacement ratio and with only $87,000 of inflation-adjusted financial wealth. Now, that's a scary number, $87,000 of financial wealth at retirement. And that includes my IRA, my 401k, my savings account, my checking account, my stocks, my bonds, my CDs, you name it. It's all in that $87,000. Every financial wealth, every bit of financial wealth I've got is included in that $87,000 number. Now, is that plausible? Do American households really retire with $87,000 of financial wealth? Here are the numbers from the Health and Retirement Survey. This is before the financial crisis. It would be worse today. In 2007, the median household between ages 65 and 74 had $68,000 of financial wealth. That's the median for the U.S. Half of the households have less than that. So my $87,000 number on the previous slide, too optimistic. Now, here's a slightly richer breakdown. Um, I'm sorry, that's the super survey of consumer finances. You can use the HRS, the Health and Retirement Study, to break down single-person households and two-person households. Single-person households aged 65 to 69 have median holdings of financial assets of $12,500. It's a terrifying number. That's what they're going to spend in retirement in addition to the Social Security. What about two-person households? They're doing better, $112,000. But that's still a frighteningly small number when we think about all the expenses that are going to hit us between 65 and eventual, um, you know, and, and the eventual end of life, which might come 30 years later. Now let's put all this together and kind of get a picture of the kind of dire consumption streams that can be supported by the wealth of retiring American households. Single-person households at the 25th percentile retire with a consumption annuity worth $9,500. Again, that's all in. That's all their wealth used to fund this hypothetical consumption annuity. Two-person households at the 25th percentile have a consumption annuity of $12,000 per person. A little bit better, above the poverty line, but not by much. Single-person households at the 50th percentile have a consumption annuity worth $16,600 and two-person households at the 50th percentile have a consumption annuity worth $20,000. This is the picture, this is the limited resources of American households entering retirement. Now, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to help these households emerge with more wealth, a better retirement? I want to offer five solutions, some of which we need to rely on the government to execute, some of which individual firms, individual households can pursue. The first is we can probably raise returns by cutting fees in a lot of these 401k accounts. Large employers have typical fees of about 30 to 50 basis points. That's fine. That's great. We're not going to cut those fees. Small employers have 401k fees of about 150 to 250 basis points. That's 1.5 to 2.5 percent of the percent of the assets each year going for fee payments. We need to push those numbers down. We need to find a way to generate returns to scale and agglomerate those accounts and get lower fees. Secondly, we need to increase access to defined contribution plans. As I mentioned earlier, only 60 percent of U.S. households work for an employer that offers defined contribution plans. The other 40 percent doesn't even have access. So we've got to increase access. And we should require not every employer, but most employers, except the very smallest employers, to offer a defined contribution plan at their workplace. Third, we should raise participation by introducing automatic enrollment at all employers, again, except for the very smallest ones that don't have these plans. Next, we should raise the typical savings rate by using much higher default savings rates in the 401k system. Right now, the typical automatic enrollment savings rate in the U.S. system is 3% of your income. So the firm is automatically enrolling you at a 3% savings rate, which is woefully inadequate for most households. We should be using much more aggressive default savings rates, and we should auto-escalate those savings rates. So if you go in at 6, you should go up automatically to 7, 8, 9, 10 as your tenure increases year by year. 
Right now, the typical worker is auto-enrolled at 3% with no auto-escalation. And finally, we should cut leakage. As I said earlier, leakage is a huge problem in the U.S. system. If people left the money in these accounts, it would be okay. But in fact, for every dollar that goes in, 50 cents comes out. Now, I don't know how to cut leakage. And the evidence that I showed you about people liking illiquid accounts is just an experiment. No one would think that that evidence resolves the question of how we should organize the American, the American saving system. But I do want you to think about how we could reduce leakage by giving people the opportunity to have more illiquid accounts, to have accounts that aren't quite so easy to drain decades before people retire. So let me ask you, why do we have 300 flavors of ice cream and hundreds of flavors of coffee, but only one flavor of retirement account? Every American worker basically has the identical system for retirement savings. Whether you call it a 401k or call it an IRA, it's still the same thing. It's an account with a 10% penalty for early withdrawal and an account that's basically very, very, very liquid. Why do we do that? Why do we make it so easy to withdraw the money and why do we give everyone the exact same system? Why don't we let households choose how to save? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we have a status quo system, a one-size-fits-all 401k or IRA. It's, a, it's the same for every single American worker. Why not consider giving Americans a choice? Why don't I tell American workers, look, there are two kinds of IRAs. There's an IRA that has a penalty for, a 10% penalty for early withdrawal and lots of liquidity opportunities. And there's a lockbox IRA, which enables you to resist temptation because the money is tied down. You can't touch it until you retire, 65, let's say. I don't want to force American workers into a lockbox IRA but I do want to give them the option to choose it if that's what they want. So why don't we give American workers an opportunity to, deci to decide for themselves? Why not give them a menu of different accounts and let them decide how to divide their money? Now, I don't know what will happen if we give American workers the ability to choose how to resist temptation. I don't know whether they will, like the subjects in our experiment, opt for illiquidity whether they'll love illiquidity, or whether they'll decide, no, 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 I need my safety blanket. I need the right to get at the money. But I do think that we desperately need to find the answer to this question. I do think that we want to know whether the current system, with all of the leakage, with all of the self-control problems, with all of the opportunities to spend before you retire, is destroying healthy retirements. And we could easily fix the problem, perhaps, by giving people the opportunity to tie their own hands. I want to urge policymakers to run this experiment and find out. The worst case scenario is that nobody chooses to tie their own hands. And the best case scenario is a revolutionary improvement to the way we save for retirement. Thank you very much.